Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and our study of the Daniel Diet. Daniel chapter 1, verses 5 through 20. Over the years, a number of hucksters have used this passage to sell books and DVDs to convince people of the idea that this passage of Scripture contains some secret diet that will guarantee better health, longer life, and even greater spiritual insight. In this study, we'll see that this is a complete fraud. The message of the text is one of courage and an unwillingness to violate the Word of God, focusing in on some young circumcised Jews who did not want to violate the law of God. So as you follow along, you might have a comment, question, or prayer request, and you can send those by email to bbbfohio at yahoo.com, or you can send your letter to P.O. Box 211. West Jefferson, Ohio, 43162. Now we begin our study of the Daniel Diet. Daniel chapter 1, verses 5 through 20. This is part 1. All right, two. get your Bible to Daniel chapter 1, if you would. We're going to start in verse 5. And I encourage you to use a Bible, or if you use a phone or whatever, or have a, a, a app or whatever, that you can take notes. And... Uh, all I can do is encourage you to do that. I can't make you. I am a dictator, but I am a benevolent dictator. Amen? Amen. Daniel chapter 1, verses 5 through 16, and we'll open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for everyone who came out tonight. Amen. Thank you for those who are watching online who, because they love the Word of God. And I thank you for all those involved in this uh, ministry because they love the King James Bible. And I'm thankful that that is because we know it is the one infallible source where we learn about Jesus. Amen. Lord, every, everyone ought to uh, be driven by a love for Jesus Christ in all we do. And that includes coming together for fellowship and for singing and prayer and Bible study, going out and preaching the gospel. Everything we do is driven by a love for Jesus Christ. We love Him because He first loved us. And we just thank You for this book we're studying because uh, there's so much in it that uh, helps us to understand our God and to understand how God works. And Lord, we're just thankful You've told us so much about Yourself in this book. It doesn't scratch the surface because You're so amazing and awesome. But it's more than we can comprehend. You are an awesome God. We love you and pray now that you help us, teach us, guide us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Tonight, I'm not saying you're fat, but we are going to study the Daniel diet. And uh, we're going to get into verse 5. Now... Um, that picture is a pretty, I put that picture on there because it's a pretty uh, accurate display. I think that shows about the age they were. They were uh, late teens, young men, and that ought to be encouragement for all you young men, you young ladies. You can serve the Lord at a young age. Amen? Amen. Yes. Christianity is not just something old people grasp onto because we're getting ready to die. Amen? Amen. That's how it's painted. That's how people paint the picture. I was like, yeah, when I get old and crushed in about to croak, that's when I'll get saved. <laughs> yeah, most of you don't make it to that. So let's begin by just reading the first few verses there. Beginning uh, verse 5, read through verse 8, read it with me. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
Now Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are now captives and eunuchs in Babylon. And in verse 5 we read, it says, the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. This, is, they had, this process looked like it's down to science. <laughs> and they bring in their captives and they would pick of the best the best looking, those that had the, they looked like they were healthy, they seemed to be sharp. You know, if we were to be taken over today, they would pass right over me and go right for Noah and Jenny and Johnny and Charlie, you know, and some of us would be left here. Amen? Amen. And uh, that's what happened here. And they uh, gave the uh, provision of the king's meat. That's the key here. That's, what, that's what's going to be the issue here, a big big part of the issue is the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. And uh, they're supposed to go through uh, three years of this. They're basically going to get a bachelor's degree in three years because they don't get any summer breaks. And that's basically what's going on here. They're going to be educated. They're going to be, uh, you know, school uh, supplied meals. They're going to, it's going to be just constant education and uh, that's and that's really what it is. It's like an ancient uh, college that they were going through, huh? Indoctrination. Yeah, indoctrination. But a lot of it was actual science and was actual, uh, uh, you know, language. The Chaldean language is what they'd study and that sort of thing as well. But um, these boys are the head of the class: Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're the they're the kids that you you kind of you know every school's got a handful that just seem to really do well in and school and active and physically capable and all that. And it says, now among these were the children of Judah. And that's something that is important for you to remember. These were uh, of the kingly lineage. These were princes. Prince Daniel. Prince Hananiah. Prince Mishael. Prince Azariah. But in order to assimilate them into Babylonian culture, each was given a name change. And we, that's why I mentioned when we sang the song during music service, there's a new name written down in glory. That's ha Our name change is coming when we stand before the King of Kings. Amen? Yeah. This name change is the opposite. Wrong direction. They went from having good names to be given names that really aren't the kind of names you want to have. Uh, in verse 7 says, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for the, he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar. That's actually a, a, same, a form of Belshazzar that will actually be the name of the king after Nebuchadnezzar we'll read about later. And to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, each of these names were connected with the false gods of Babylon. And it's kind of what happens uh, whenever... Um, it, it's kind of interesting here. Um, this isn't Islam, but there's some similarities. And one of them is, is how many of you know who Cassius Clay is? I don't care what anybody says, I believe he's the greatest boxer to ever live. He converted to Islam and changed his name to what? The name of the false prophet and the false god. <laughs> and that's what you have. What's his name? Uh, Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens, you remember him, the singer? Mm -hmm. And he, he got uh, converted and changed his name to something that had to do with Allah, you know. And uh, so there's other similarities, we'll, and we'll see as we look at these names here real quick. Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar. And I went to a place called Behind the Name, and I've, I've gone there numerous times. It looks very accurate. I've compared and everything. Names... And Belteshazzar means Bel, protect the king. And is actually a variation, as I said, of Belshazzar. So Daniel's Babylonish, Babylonish name was a uh, uh, tribute to Bel and his power to protect the king. Uh, Hananiah was given the name Shadrach. That means command of Aku. Now look at this. Aku being the name of the Babylonian god of the moon. That's right. If you know anything about Islam, you know Allah was the moon god of the Arabians and Muhammad decided that instead of being pantheistic, he would just get rid of all the other gods and elevate the moon god. So this is another similarity there, isn't it? Isn't it interesting? Mishael, his name is changed to Meshach. His name is, who is what? 
Aku is. It's kind of like, you know, who is like Jesus? You know, and the answer should be no one. But in reality, it's about a fourth of Mexico <laughs> is named Jesus, you know. Um, but in reality, it, it, you know, no one's like Jesus, but they're asking who is what Aku is. And uh, Aku is the name um, of, as I said, the Babylon god of the moon. And then we have Azariah was given the name Abednego. That means servant of Nebo. And Nebo was the Babylonian god of wisdom. And so Azariah's name was servant of Nebo. And of course, ne uh, I've got, yeah, Nebo. And I think that's, I'm, I didn't put it in here, but we'll, in a future study we'll look at Nebuchadnezzar. And I think that's where part of his name comes from. Well, Daniel was not impressed. <laughs> Uh, you never see Daniel using that name. Um, you don't see any of the Jews using those names themselves. They, were, they would use those of those. But Daniel also is not impressed with this diet plan. The king's meat and the wine. He says, uh, verse 8, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not... Look at that word. What's it say? Defile. Defile himself. He wasn't just being picky. It wasn't just that he didn't like meat. It wasn't that he wouldn't drink wine. It's the fact that that meat and wine is defiled. There was nothing wrong with the food. And as we continue, or before Daniel and after Daniel, you, and, and you'll see Jesus. He ate meat. Uh, after being resurrected, he ate fish. Turned the water into wine. It wasn't the problem with the fact there was meat and wine. The problem was the food and wine was simply not what we would call today kosher. And it was defiled by the means of preparation. And uh, the, the uh, method, just for starters, when you kill an animal to eat the meat as a Jew, you, you kill it by bleeding it. And uh, all the blood is, is drained, basically, from the animal. Whereas in other places, they just strangle animals. And, and uh, you know, when they slaughter them, it's a bloody mess, and they just cook it like that. And there's, there's contamination that takes place. Um, you know, animals carry blood diseases and parasites and things. So God's not only got his reasons in the picture of how Christ spilled his blood for us on the cross, so there's a lot of concern there in the temple sacrifice, but it also is just a matter of being smart. Um, you look at the law, a lot of what the Jews were told to do was clean and not just in a spiritual or temple uh, uh, religious sense. It was clean in a practical sense. Uh, you can thank God, really, uh, for the, every time you flush the toilet or every time someone else flushes the toilet and the fact that they just don't go out in the backyard like the dogs mm -hmm. or dump in a box like your kittens. Why? Because that's what Gentiles did. Yep. Gentiles went in a bucket or a bowl or something and threw it out in the yard. Yeah. What did God say to do? He said, you get yourself a little paddle and you keep it on your person or on your belongings and when you've got to relieve yourself, you go outside of the camp and you bury it. What do we do? Well, we just kind of cut out the middleman and now we flush it and it goes outside the camp. <laughs> See? Same thing. Well, when it comes to food, uh, Gentiles have fought it and fought it and fought it, but uh, you know they follow a lot of the kosher rules because it's just smart. And when you find out that there's uh, salmonella and, and all kinds of diseases uh, being spread by food and all these scares of food coming in from Mexico and places like that and making people sick, what you find out, it's a cleanliness issue. Yeah. And I follow cleanliness laws or rules. So a little reality check, this is not a biblical diet or some key to spiritual power. And if you go up to the Lifeway bookstore, go out on the internet, you're going to find all these books encouraging you to go on the Daniel diet. It'll be the key to you being healthy. And you, it, 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 I'm not kidding you, this is how they sell it. it. It will begin to unlock your spiritual senses. And you will be able to hear the voice of God and be driven and guided by Him like never before for a 
small fee of $29.95 for my book and $39.95 I'll throw in the DVD. Isn't that funny how, you know, you got all this stuff and it's such wonderful news, but it's going to cost you. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is go pick up your Bible and you see that there's no place in there where it told anybody else to follow that diet. You don't, you don't see anybody else being told to do that. Amen. And the Jews themselves before Daniel and after Daniel didn't follow that diet that we're going to see because this was out of necessity. Amen. You know, during the Great Depression, uh, my grandpa, out of necessity, ate sweet potatoes like there was no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's why growing up, I never saw him eat a sweet potato. Why? Out of necessity, he ate sweet potatoes. When it was no longer necessary, he never touched them. <laughs> and that's what this pulse diet that we're going to see is all about. It's a Jew under the law, keeping the law. Yep. And he doesn't want to eat unclean meat and drink unclean wine. That's all there is to it. Let's continue reading. Beginning of verse 9, read with me. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in the flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. That's, how, that's what happened. That's just that simple. Uh, it's an amazing statement there in verse 9. It says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. So you see this over and over. And uh, I've, I've experienced this myself on a couple of occasions. It's kind of blows your mind a little bit. But you remember how Joseph, uh, not, not just once, with Potiphar, you know, for example, and Potiphar's wife was a, you know, scoundrel and she got him in trouble and then he ends up then being bettered by that after going to prison for a while and the, he's made the, basically the prince of Egypt. He's made the, he ruled second only to Pharaoh himself and that Pharaoh loved Joseph. And it affected them for generations. It was 400 years before a bad Pharaoh turned on them after Joseph. And here you have this going on with Daniel. And you see this in other times and other places in the, in the uh, Scripture. And I've told the story uh, a couple of times where, you know, one example is I was working for a man who's a professing atheist. And um, we had uh, very, I don't say heated, but we had, you know, debates and I would just tell him, I said, man, you got to be crazy to believe what you're telling me. You know, we'd, we'd, he'd tell me. I said, you know, it's like this. He didn't use this. We hear atheists talk about the spaghetti monster in the sky and that stuff, you know. And so we had those kind of discussions. One day, as I said, he professed to be an atheist. One day he comes in and he says, uh, he calls him back to his office. And he says, you know, I'm just going to say this, this has got to be God. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you're an atheist. You're not supposed to say that. And he says, I was going to get rid of a bunch of these suits and, and I just kept, something kept telling me, you need to give those to Greg. He can preach in these. <laughs> okay, now, what's the chances, if we're going to talk odds here, of an atheist man having voices telling him, a voice telling him to give about $5,000 worth of clothes to a preacher when he's an atheist? I don't think that was Satan. You can't deny it after that. Well, they can. They shouldn't. It doesn't make any logical sense. I, I, I love the guy, but that's why the Bible says a fool has said in his heart there is no yeah, God. Yeah. I believe he really, I'm not saying he heard voices like an audible voice or anything, but he knew something, someone, 
was pushing him to do that and give these suits to somebody who's going to be out there preaching the exact opposite of what he believed. And I could tell you story after story after story, that kind of thing. And uh, it's just a, if you serve the Lord with love and people can see the love of God in you. See, but I, I didn't walk around always saying, God loves you. You're special. You're beautiful. I like you just the way you are. I didn't do that. But that's what people think demonstrating the love of God is. To walk around like a goofball. And that's not what it is. What it is was, and I'm just telling you, I, I served the Lord. I, there was a zeal, but it was I didn't hate Him even though He was an atheist. He knew I was praying for Him. He knew I loved Him enough I wanted to see Him in heaven. That was demonstrating the love of God. But I never laid down like a doormat just let Him walk on me. And, you know, we have give and take, you know. I was a real man, he's a real man. We have it out, you know, every once in a while. Not mean, but, you know. So I just want to encourage you, be real. And uh, God rewards it. It doesn't say God worked against the will of Melzar, by the way. But that Melzar re received the influence of God. See? In other words, uh, this isn't a proof text for Calvinism. This isn't some kind of unconditional election of pagans. <laughs> but God does recognize some people are open to being moved to do what's right. Unsaved people can be influenced by God. Did you know that? Uh, sometimes what you pray for is A, that so-and-so gets saved. B, in the meantime, Lord, could you do this? <laughs> So another reality check, and I love this thought. Who knows? Melzar might have become a believer at some point. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. We're not told otherwise. And he was an eyewitness to some pretty wild stuff. And I believe we're going to see later Nebuchadnezzar. I really believe that Nebuchadnezzar was in heaven. Isn't he the only Gentile to write scripture? Uh, dic yeah, dictated right. the chapter. Where, yeah, yeah. Is it? Five, I think it is. Yeah. Verse 10, start out by saying, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. Keep in mind, he's just doing his job and he's concerned about his head. <laughs> literally. <laughs> he's not using figurative figures of speech. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. He's not joking. He's, I mean, that's the kind of thing that happened. You lose your head. It's just common sense concern here. You can't blame Melzar for being sensible. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We see the first example of the wisdom of Daniel. This is our first example, but there's many of the wisdom of Daniel. He said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us... What's that word? That's not to do this. Pulse to eat. And what to drink? Water. Good old H2O. My kids, man. They, every time they sat down to eat, they thought they had to have Kool-Aid, Pop. So I said, we're drinking water. Oh. I said, you know what? What I'll do is make you go out and work on the, in the yard for about an hour and a half. And then offer you water. Then you'd appreciate it. Amen? Amen. I was an old meanie. <laughs> Let's get this straight. Daniel's diet was not porridge. I say that because I actually heard a guy preach and he kept referring to Daniel eating porridge. If you thought it was porridge, you might be thinking of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. That's porridge. You remember that story? What book of the Bible is that in? It's apocryphal. Amen? Or this. Peas porridge hot, peas porridge cold, peas porridge in the pot nine days old. How are you, you familiar with that? Did you know this is free of charge, doesn't have anything to do with anything? There's a real woman, they believe there's a real woman who was called Mother Goose. I can't remember her first name, but I think it's Elizabeth. And she married Mr. Goose, and he died, and she was a grandma, and she made up these little... Uh, nursery rhymes for the kids back in the 18th century and they nicknamed her Mother Goose. See, I learned something when I study for these, uh, you know, these uh, messages. 
You may not learn anything, but I do. How many of you knew that Mother Goose may be a real person? Two of you, all right. Either way, pulse is not porridge. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Ten days, ten day test. Interesting parallel passage in Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Daniel and Revelation are like that. You constantly see these things that sometimes there's not even a clear connection, but they're so familiar. If you don't think that what Daniel's going through is a time of great tribulation for him, uh, you didn't, you, we're going to do a study on the captivity, the Babylonian captivity, just so you understand. This is a horrible thing. Um, how many of you would be upset if you got home tonight and you found that they had totally destroyed your, your house, taken all your belongings, they immediately arrest you, and they take the women off to serve them, and all the men are taken off to be slaves for the rest of your life. How many of you... You didn't see the worst part. The worst part. They also became units. Well, yeah, then the, the young men that they took here, yeah. And then... As a Jew, your temple is destroyed. And that was your life. Your whole life, if you were practicing, observing Jew, everything gone. But we, just, we don't put it in our thinking as we read the Bible too often. I'm as guilty as anybody. That's why I constantly stop and say, wait a minute, what's going on here? And if you'll do that when you're reading the Bible, it'll really help you grasp and help, you, help it sink in continues and says, Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. In other words, after this 10-day test, check us out and compare us to the little pagan kids over here. That's kind of what happened with homeschooling in America, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Homeschoolers were like, you know, freaks. And they're like, hey, wait a minute here. Let us homeschool our kids and then they'll take your test that you your educated kids will take, and let's see how this works out. And what happened was the publicly educated kids, the public education system was totally embarrassed. So then, all that did was make them angry. <laughs> did, under Jimmy Carter, man, they went after the homeschoolers. Reagan gave them a break and they were able to build things up, then come along Bill Clinton. He tried to shut down homeschooling. Thankfully, then, we elected a GOP Congress, and all he could do was veto the bills he didn't like. That saved America. Amen? Amen. With God-given wisdom, Daniel negotiates a clinical trial of a kosher diet. <laughs> See, it's all in how you think, you know. That's what happened. Daniel, the art of the deal. <laughs> Amen? He negotiates this clinical trial of a kosher diet. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and what? Come on, say it with feeling. Amen. Amen. Does that make me look fat? Well, yes, honey. No, you don't understand. The Bible says that's a good thing. Fatter in the flesh, in flesh, than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. So these guys are living on pulse, which is basically grain, grain diet. And, and water, and they look fatter, they look healthier. We need to clarify something right here. Gluttony is not fat or being overweight. There's all this nonsense, and I get almost every queer who watches one of my videos sends me a message about me being a glutton. Hey, you ever preach on gluttony there, fatso? 